Hi, I'm Celeste Freeman, Vice President of Community Outreach for Let's See Her. Welcome to Putting Black Women on the Map. I'm Jesse Steigerwald and so glad to be here with you today. This installation came about because Lexi Her has been working to make women visible in the community of Lexington, Massachusetts, birthplace of the American Liberty. Our prime project has been bringing a new monument to the historic district here in Lexington that will tell the story of more than 20 historic significant women who are very worthy of recognition. You're going to meet some of those women with us today here in the gallery at LexArt. LexArt was so kind and generous in reaching out and saying, hey, we have space, you have really important stories, and you're doing work that relates to the arts. Would you like to come in and share what you're learning? This is a perfect match for us. You're gonna to see today stories about five women in close, up, you know, up close and in depth, and you'll hear about many other black women in Lexington for whom we are still doing research and would love to learn more. You're here, we're gonna welcome you to get involved with the project if you like doing research. We'll be talking about textiles and different forms of art and the way they combine with historical research to actually put black women on the map. Our hope is that you will walk away from this installation understanding that black women is her story, is women's history, is American history. So first to give you some context, we are covering 300 years of Lexington's history, but we want to give you a real reminder that there's about 12,000 at least uh, years of indigenous presence in this area, and we're just doing a snippet of time with those 300 years. Important to those of you who are watching this, but just a small piece of the timeline. Um, and in speaking of indigenous history, we actually acknowledge the fact that when we're talking about the history of enslavement in New England, which might be new for some people in our audience, we have to start with indigenous peoples. That's where enslavement actually began. Uh, Massachusetts was actually the first colony to legalize slavery. Oftentimes we are hearing about enslavement in terms of geography, the South. We thought it was really important with this first part of the installation to center ourselves right here in Lexington. So you're actually looking at want ads who are described, that are describing people who are running away from enslavers in Lexington. One of them happens to be indigenous, one of them happens to be a child, and the student art here really captures this idea of enslavement separating families. That a child could be and was often, was often sold away from their mother, from their parents. And we thought just to start here and get us all centered was really important. The student work has been really meaningful because part of what we're working on is portraying women for whom we have no portraits, no photographs, no paintings, no sketches. These women are important to understand when we want to really get an accurate and inclusive story about our history in Lexington. But to imagine what the women look like, we've taken some different strategies. One of them is looking at mapping. And so you're seeing a map here, and we're calling this our putting women on the map strategy. And what we're doing is we're looking at a copy, an artistic rendering of a map that's supposed to show us Lexington in 1775 at the time of the Battle of Lexington. Of course, at that time, the Battle Green was just called the Town Commons. It's where people shared land. They went to church. The largest building in town was the Meeting House, centered very prominently right near where the Captain Parker statue is today. So when we go through this installation today, we're going to focus on three women and their stories during the 1700s. And we're thinking about where do these women live? When we try to do research about black women, it's much more difficult to figure out literally where they slept, where did they raise their children, where were they cooking their meals? Because we don't always know if a woman was married, if she was living in the home of the person who enslaved her, if she was enslaved, or in the case of one of the women we'll talk about, she was married to someone who was also enslaved by a different person. So where did she live? Where did they raise their family? We know then there's a presence for that family probably in two locations on our map. We're going to start out though in north, we're going to call it sort of the north part of our map, talking about Phoebe Bannister Burdue. And she was a free woman in Lexington, and her story for us starts in the 1750s. 
So as we mentioned earlier, we're trying to capture these women in as many different ways as we can. One of the most important would be the idea of what would they wear in their dresses. And so right here you see an apron, you see obviously colors and fabric, and the idea was to make sure that each individual woman is represented, but also tells a story about that particular time period. One thing we've noticed in speaking with people, when they imagine women in the past, sometimes they just can't get a picture in their head. And so the woman becomes less than, somehow simpler or less intelligent. But actually, when you start thinking about well, these people got up in the morning and they had breakfast and they had whole full lives, seeing their clothing is helping people get more connected. When we talk about Phoebe Bannister Bourdieu, we don't know a lot about her. We're really interested in learning more. Alexandra Molman has done quite a bit of research that's helped us. We've got a family tree here, and that's another strategy for helping get a better, more full sense of each of the women we're talking about. We do not know where Phoebe was born or when she was born. The story for us begins in 1754 when she arrives in Lexington and she gets married to a man named Moses Burdu. Now, by the time she gets here, the Burdu family has been living here for generations. They're a free black family and they are farmers. So when she moves in and gets married, she too becomes a farmer. And they have a child whose name is Eli, and Eli goes on to serve in the Revolutionary War. So we think of her as a mother of the Revolution in the very literal sense that her son ends up being in the battle. Now, there are not a lot of historical documents, but Celeste is going to show you one that we do have, which is great. So finding records on women from 300 years ago is really, really hard to do. If you're a black woman, even more so. So what's exciting about Phoebe is that she actually is listed as part of a list of people who have recently become married or wedded in Lexington. So to actually see that in written form for us as researchers and members of Lexi, her is very exciting. It literally puts her on the map to say she was here, she lived here. Now the student work is helping us again see her as a full person. We see her here as a younger person, and then we see her closer as we imagine to the age she was when she would have been married and then had a child. Now after she died, her son was very young. We don't know how she died or why she died. We know it's about two years after his birth, roughly. And there's things we can think about at the time. We know that maternal mortality was very high during this time period and much higher for black women, just as it is in America today. So it's possible that she could have had another pregnancy. We don't know. She could have had any number of medical issues. One thing we really try to do in Lex See Her is stick with the facts. So we can tell you ideas or possibilities, but we really think that actually the truth is good enough. So knowing that she was here, knowing that she had this child and that she left a trace that way, that's, that's meaningful to us. So now we're excited to introduce Kate Chester to you. Kate, we know much more about Kate, and it's going to be interesting for you to hear the difference in the sort of outline of Phoebe's life compared with Kate's life where we have much more detail. And we'll talk about why we have so much more information. A lot of it comes down to what happens if a woman is free and also is able to own land. It changes things really significantly. Now, part of how we're showing that we know more about her is if you look at the textiles here, you're gonna see that we presented um, actually a much more complete outfit for Kate. We're kind of filling in more detail. We're seeing a cap. That cap is actually based on one that was worn by Phyllis Wheatley in the time period um, with a straw bonnet. And then we also are seeing sort of a less formal morning jacket. And then we're seeing a work apron. An apron that has a texture or a pattern is one that a woman would have worn at home. Women had their hands full in terms of taking care of domestic chores. And aprons at this time were worn by men, women, and children. They were worn in the home and they were worn out, out when you went out socializing. And we'll talk more about that. But here you can see on the family tree that we have been able through research from Margaret Michelet and some researchers in Boxborough, as well as a descendant of Kate Chester's, whose name is Tara Gibson, to learn about multi-generations in Kate's family. Her story begins in 1742. She was born in Boston and a white man named Phineas Taylor purchased her for a box of butter. 
She was then brought to Boxborough, where she stayed with him. He was married and had children. We don't know a lot about what happened, but we do know that she negotiated her freedom from Phineas Taylor so that she became free, and he also gave her a piece of land. And something we've been wondering about is, why did he give her that land? Again, with Lexier, we stick to the facts that we know she ends up having land. We also know the land that they had in their family continues to remain in the family, something that we think about when we talk about um, the power that she had or maybe greater security. But she came to Lexington and she lived here right at the time leading up to the Battle of Lexington. So a very historic figure for us. And thanks to records from the town, including this one, this is, uh, receipt from the town where in 1812 um, Kate's daughter received payment for having taken care of a relative who was sick at the time. It's a lot of details there which we won't go into right now, but really nice to know our town's website has this document on it which ties us into Kate's history. So the student artwork reflects the fact that we do know more about the details of Kate's life. So on the wall you will see um, important events in her life, such as we imagine the day she's told that she now has land, has a house, and there's a key being exchanged. Keys were very important at this time in terms of what they symbolized around land ownership or owning a home. Um, one of our students also had the creative idea of she's portraying Kate as a young adult woman, but remembering that story is not even a story, an event about her being treated for a pound of butter and keeping that foremost in our minds about what her early life would have been like. Imagining this three-year-old, if she was even three years old, we guess she was around that age, being put on a horse with a stranger, taken away from city urban life and all that she knew, including her parents, and brought out to the faraway countryside in an entirely new environment. So I really remark upon that. Um, other events we capture are wedding day, wedding, you know, imagining her having a wedding day picture um, and also being married, I believe, by Reverend Jonas Clark. And we have a student who depicted you know, his home at the time and them walking up or walking away from having been married by him on that particular day. One nice part of the historic record is that we know through Jonas Clark's account books, the Reverend Clark, that he hired this family. He hired Kate and her husband to do work for him. So her husband, Prince, was hired. He had also, by the way, he had been enslaved and he was free when they got married, although we don't have a lot of details. So Prince was hired to prepare flax to be spun into, into yarn that would make cloth. And Kate was hired to do the spinning. And so we have a spinning wheel here in the installation. And we think a lot about what it was like in the years leading up to the battle. We know that everybody was British living here then, a subject of the king, and that taxes had increased on textiles. Clothing's really important. I have here a copy of a probate record. So when people die, their estate is evaluated. And you would notice, if you take a close look, that the value of their clothing is listed because it's really a very special um, commodity. People don't have a clothing closet or drawers full of different outfits, and you made all of your clothing by hand. So we know that when she was being hired to spin, it's partially because rather than buying cheap imported fabrics, which is what people had come to do by this time in the 1770s, rather than making their own, they didn't want to pay the taxes. So we know in 1769 there was a women's protest here where they were like, you know what, we'd rather spin ourselves, even though it's a lot of work. But that hard work and repetitive work, if you could, if you had the ability, you would pass that off to someone else. So Jonas Clark wasn't spinning or having someone in his house spin. He was outsourcing and hiring Kate to do it. It also tells us that she had some income. And from what we see in her probate records, seems that she had a really good business sense about her and something she must have had to survive. So we're talking about women's work, which is really often the, you know, the backbone of a community and how it sustains itself in terms of its life. So our student did a couple of things. She did a depiction of Kate as a mother with a young child churning butter. Again, another really important thing that had to happen um, in a community. But also did a, you know, a picture sort of imagining Kate looking out on this land that she now has obtained and being able to just sort of breathe in that sense of liberation and freedom, which I'd actually love. At some point, Kate 
decides to go back to Boxborough and she takes her family there. She had two children born in Lexington, Ruth and then Lucy, and her next children were all born in Boxborough. So we think then about these future generations and we have a lot of insight thanks to an incredible woman named Kara Gibson who jumped into the Lex Seher world. Celeste, you can tell that story better because you met her. So what I'm really happy to talk about is the story of Tara Gibson, the woman I mentioned who very generously donated some of these letters to us and pictures and tell you her story. It's such an American story we don't often get to hear about. So Tara Gibson becomes a Chester through adoption. We mentioned that Mary Chester is the granddaughter of Kate Chester. Mary Chester was really known in her time as a really prominent civil rights worker and abolitionist in Boxborough. So her name was obviously pretty well known. What we understand is that a young white woman from Scotland came to Mary Chester and said, I fathered a child by a black man um, for a lot of different reasons. I cannot raise this child and stay in this community. Would you be willing to adopt her? Her name is Annie. And Mary Chester decides that, yes, I will adopt this child. So we have an adoption actual family story. Um, what happens is that although Mary Dyson, who's a Scottish mother, hands over her child for someone to take care of her, she still maintains a connection. So it becomes a real story of interracial love. She writes letters to Mary Chester. She's asking how Annie is doing. When she can, she is sending money. And this is after Mary Dyson has married and had her own family. She is still um, establishing herself as being the parent of Annie. So I actually, I just love telling this story. I love this part too. A lot of the letters end with uh, give a kiss to Annie for me, which is very heartwarming. And then we see over here in this family photograph, we see both Mary Dyson and Mary Ann Chester, as well as Annie. And then here in this picture that Tara shared with us, we see the next generations. So it brings us down to Tara and her sister, India, um, who has kept some of the family recipes going and actually makes soap as her passion, keeping some of the quote, women's work happening in their family. And we are really grateful to Tara and to her family for making it possible to see this. I think something that, again, some people don't realize about thinking about black people in particular in our area is this multi-generational, strong layers of family. And I think it helps, again, hopefully break through some people's stereotypes where they're just missing out on all these amazing people. So some of you in our audience might remember from last year's installation that we focused on a woman named Margaret Tulip. Um, her story is striking for a number of reasons. The most probably remarkable part is that she actually filed a lawsuit on behalf of herself and her son um, to, I would say, regain, not even become free, to regain her freedom. Her understanding was that she actually was free at a certain point and there became a dispute between her previous enslaver, Amos Muzzy, and she went to court and she lost initially, she appealed, and she ultimately won herself freedom for herself and her son. But we have so much more to tell of her story through her descendants and her legacy that we can't wait to share with you. We have so much more detail about Margaret Tulip thanks to the fact that her court case means that there are many documents and depositions that tell about her life during her own lifetime in the 1700s. Leslie Masson did that research for us and is still working to learn more about her son's case. We've also made contact with descendants of the family, including Yvonne and James Goldsberry and Carol Tucker, and they've brought to light all this great information about new generations of history. And some of their papers from their family are held at the, Ameri the American Antiquarian Society. And Elizabeth Pope, who's a curator there, has let us share some images here. So if you are able to visit, you would see a photograph of the great granddaughter, also a Martha Ann Brown is her name. And she was very prominent in Worcester, one of the community's leading ladies, if you will, um, doing volunteer work, doing abolition work, and their family has continued to do all kinds of civil rights work across generations. So fortunately, they were able to come and visit at Lexington High School to share some of that history with us. And the more we learn, the more we appreciate their stories. Student work here is helping us imagine again how we could picture Margaret Tulip. So 
two things that have always stood out for me. Uh, one is the fact that when she was three weeks old, um, Margaret was sold into enslavement. We understand that she probably was diagnosed with something called with rickets. Uh, she, was, she was considered to be um, malformed at the time, not my terminology, um, and not really expected to survive. So here she is, her mom, Kate, who we have depicted over here, is losing her three-week-old infant to strangers, and she's being hauled off to Woburn, not expected to survive, and she does, um, only to become, um, at the age of five months, to be traded for a colt. So we, her theme of this, um, I wouldn't even call it being an, I guess you would call it being orphaned by circumstance, but this lost childhood has been very striking, at least for me, in talking about Margaret's story. So the fact of her legal success makes it all the more remarkable um, some, some years later. So the children really focused on a number of things. This idea of probably not being able to actually shed tears in public, but thinking about the tears that she couldn't have shared, that she probably did privately, um, around her loss of her mother, loss of any connections to family, um, things that she um, just didn't have. So I thought this, the picture here really kind of just captures that sense of emotion. Um, other pictures here are just, just imagining her as this toddler infant uh, with no family connections to take. So who took care of her? That's our big question. Who fed this child? Who nurtured her? Who got her to actually learn to walk, which she did? Um, um, we just don't want to lose sight of that. But then we also have other artwork that imagines, again, women's work. How did she support herself once she was liberated? We imagine she may have done, could have been laundry, could have been, she could be a seamstress, anything she could to support that her family in surviving. When we think about Kate, the court documents do refer to her mother, and we don't know Kate's full name, but we do know that Kate was a teenager when she had Margaret's older brother, whose name was Sambo, and still a teenager when she gave birth to Margaret. Um, so she was really a very young person, and the separation, the forced separation of mothers and children, of families, is something that in our permanent monument is uh, something that we want to keep clear because we're really very fortunate to get more information about these families. But again, going back to the map, there are many black women in Lexington, some free, many enslaved, for whom we don't have this information. Maybe we'll have it next year when we see you again, but we're still searching. So one of our themes is tied to her apron strings. And on this wall, I think of legacy in a different kind of way, that we're gonna be talking about women on this wall whose work would not be possible without the pioneering efforts of the women we, we talked about earlier. This question of freedom and liberation and what it, opportunities it provides, I think becomes really evident. So we think about Mary Elizabeth Bibb, 100 years after a Margaret Tulip, this is a free woman of color from Rhode Island who comes to what we call the normal school in Lexington and is its first black woman graduate, becomes an educator, becomes an abolitionist. And actually we wonder if she actually may have become one of the first black women journalists. So Mary Elizabeth marries a man who was formerly enslaved and because of fugitive slave laws in this country, they chose to leave, they actually become refugees, head to Canada, create their own paper called The Fugitive. And we suspect because Mary is the one who had the formal education, although she's not acknowledged as the editor, probably did most of the writing that her husband got credit for. But in Canada, she creates integrated schools where black and white children can attend, um, she really makes her mark. She's in what I consider an unsung, well, maybe she's not so unsung now, an unsung hero um, who had real roots here in Lexington in terms of her beginning. Now, Mary Elizabeth is one of the women, again, in the permanent monument that we are bringing to Lexington. And another woman is Sylvia Farrell Jones. Sylvia Farrell Jones is much more recent. And so for the women we've talked about so far, we've had to use strategies like textiles, maps, historical artifacts and documents, student illustrations, including drawings and paintings and portraits and landscapes. Um, for Sylvia, we have photographs. And Sylvia uh, went to Cornell College, and then she went on to Yale Law School. 
After she graduated, she went into the finance world and had a very successful career, but decided she wanted to make a change. She moved into the nonprofit sector, where she worked for Boys and Girls Club, and then made a switch to what is now YW of Boston. Um, and she had an incredible passion for two connected things in terms of social justice. One was in terms of addressing racism, and the other was in terms of addressing sexism. And she felt that they went hand in hand and that you needed to dismantle both in order to have a better, more just society. So Sylvia is a real role model for us. Um, she was a member of Pilgrim Congregational Church and was nominated when we had our open five-month process with Lexi here to ask people in the community who they felt should be recognized in the monument. So we're very glad to know more about her. And when we think about her, um, her family has, has shared photographs with us and also some of her clothing. It gives us another reminder again about the multi-dimensions of every woman and why it's so nice that we're learning more about the historic women because they, just like Sylvia, they had family, they had friends, they had hobbies, they had work they did. Some of them had a faith institution or other organization that was important to them. So we're very fortunate to Sal and to their family for sharing. And because textiles have been so important here, we'll show you this one. We know that one of Sylvia's passions was the Patriots. And this jersey, when it came in for us to share, had a very lovely treat on the back because Sylvia has her personalized jersey. And we're going to close by just showing you what we call the red carpet. And it emphasizes why textiles have been so important for this project and why we're so glad to be able to be welcome here at Lex Art. So one of the things that was really important for me in terms of thinking about these previously unknown women is to have a real sense of respect and honoring their contributions by having a literal red carpet. The idea being that most of them would have died without any sense of name recognition or leaving any known footprints that we would actually recognize. So I wanted visitors to walk into the installation and notice that we're saying, no, they're here, they're important, and they deserve to be honored. One thing we're really appreciative of is Lex Hart kind of rolling out the red carpet for Lex Seher. Because as we work to bring this new monument to the community, we're all volunteers, we don't have an office space, and being able to share some of what we've learned in this kind of setting is really helpful. The red carpet, of course, also speaks to the importance of what we've recognized for centuries and eons, that fashion and what people wear has a lot of meaning for them. At this time period, when we've talked about the 1700s, Women were sewing their own clothing and the clothing for their family. It spent a lot of time and effort to make their outfits. So we're thinking about the silhouettes and profiles of women in the 1700s, and then moving up to the 1800s with Mary Elizabeth Miles Bibb, where forms completely change, and then coming up to Sylvia Farrell Jones with an outfit that her family has donated to us. Now, one thing that the Girl Scouts really noticed is that uh, pants are here. And for hundreds of years, and even till pretty recently in my lifetime, women weren't free to wear pants. And that kind of uh, memory for us is something important that we can all latch on to. Um, women really had to actually fight in the 1990s, as recently as that, to change workplace dress codes so that women could choose to wear pants if they wished. Not a small thing, although Sylvia's accomplishments are far greater than that, she is a woman who has made serious inroads that we are benefiting from today. Our apron project is a way that you can get involved if you like to sew. There are so many more women from the 1700s, black women whose stories we would like to be able to show in a respectful and dignified way. So volunteers have been sewing aprons with one apron for each of the women whose identities we'd, we've been able to find out. Um, a lot of thanks to Ann Grady for the research she's done. Lexington Historical Society has continued doing work, as has the Association of Black Citizens of Lexington. So the Lex See Her project is very centered on making women visible. And these aprons is one way to kind of re in, uh, to, to reconnect with what women have done and express the individual personality of each person. Thank you for joining us today. We also did not want to leave without thanking another person who's part of our co-curating team this year at Lex Art, Amelia Worthy, who is doing an incredible job bringing 
Margaret Tulip to life. So we wanna say thank you, Amelia. And if you see her around town, please acknowledge all the work that she's done. The dress you see behind us was actually fitted for Amelia. She will be the face of Margaret Tulip in the monument and we could not have done that. And when we think about the monument, we do encourage people to get involved as volunteers or if you're able to, to make a contribution. The monument is going to be a permanent, made out of bronze, really permanent, um, tribute to the women you've heard about today, in addition to other women who've made contributions in this community across time. These are women whose stories are important, they're significant, and by telling those stories and by putting faces to these women, it's a way to really tell a more complete and accurate story about America. We're so fortunate to be connected to each other, to the project, to these women from the past, and we would love to make a connection with you as well. Thank you again for joining us.